And it's time now to move straight on to our next keynote speaker. I'm going to introduce Dr. Francis Koya Vakauta. Francis is the team leader, culture for development at the Human Rights and Social Development Program, Pacific Community, based in Suva. And before joining Pacific Communities this year, Francis was Associate Professor and Director of the Oceania Center for Arts, Culture and Pacific Studies at the University of the South Pacific. A teacher by profession, her focus was on curriculum studies, culture and multicultural education, small island developing states, indigenous and Pacific studies and resilience in education for sustainability. What an amazing career. Frances has very kindly shared her presentation with us. She's not able to be here to answer questions live, but you can still ask them. So please do fire them through. Use the live Q&A button as opposed to the discussion forum for these questions, because then we can easily send them off to Francis. So put those questions through as soon as they occur to you. But right now, oh my tipaki paki, please enjoy this presentation from Dr. Francis Koya Vaka Uta. Bonavinaka and greetings from Suva, Fiji. I acknowledge the ancestors of all the lands represented in this convening and seek their blessings as we gather to share ideas and stories. Binaka Vakalevu to the organizers for the invitation to share some thoughts about the future of Pacific libraries. I offer these humble reflections in the hope that they provide some added value to the discussions over the next few days. Binaka. My presentation explores the idea of decolonizing the Pacific Library. And I note that there have been several efforts to do this elsewhere in the world. I'm also interested in the critical role of rethinking our systems and institutions, such as libraries of the future, and how they might contribute to building the strong knowledge-based and resilient societies that we hope for. On this first slide, we see images of a selection of Pacific Island public libraries. This presentation reflects on opportunities to transform library spaces such as these. I will cover several key issues, such as the inherently ethnocentric and Anglocentric systems of power, systems which perpetuate colonial legacies that govern the way that we see knowledge-based institutions such as libraries and our places within them. It touches also on indigenous knowledge systems in the context of a knowledge-based society, as well as issues around literacy, the concept of open living libraries, and technology in the Pacific context. We know that libraries like museums and archives are important knowledge repositories, but we don't often acknowledge that they are inherently colonial constructs. While the current digital era raises questions about the relevance of such physical knowledge repositories, the infrastructure and its contents represent so much more. As a colonial legacy, Pacific libraries have historically privileged knowledge about and from the outside world. Pacific collections, even in the Pacific itself, tend to be the smaller counterpart in comparison to global fiction and nonfiction collections. Essentially, the library has perpetuated a particular knowledge system and colonial languages of power, both of which are premised on what Zurich and Young term as epistemological and institutional racism. I bring this to the fore of my presentation, as we don't often acknowledge the systemic ethnocentrism across all of our systems and structures, which ultimately impact the way we see the world and our place in it. This is necessarily a conversation about the economic value of knowledge and the cultural and language gaps that such a system perpetuates. Any Talanoa about decolonization has root in discourse around epistemology and our conceptions of worthwhile knowledge and about how we learn, 
how we come to know, and who the knowers of a particular knowledge system are. We are all familiar with the adage, knowledge is power, and this is painfully clear when we think about the inherent systemic violence that Spivak refers to in her seminal question, can the subaltern speak? She draws attention to the silencing of marginalized or colonized groups. For Pacific peoples, our worldviews are centered around relationality, and our identities are relational identities. Culturally, we value relationships in and between communities, with the ancestors, as well as generations not yet born. We speak of connections to land, sky, and sea, and we often identify with the role or identity of custodians. Our oral cultures are thousands of years old, and our cultural practice is informed by a heritage captured in our languages, our stories, and our cultural memory. The written, literary, and literacy-based culture was introduced less than 300 years ago. We need to remember this fact as we attempt to contextualize and situate the cultural relevance of the library in a Pacific context. The library plays a critical role in literate and literacy-based cultures. And as a result of colonization, Christianization, and the introduction of the formal school system some 200 years ago, libraries found a place in our societies. Over the years, our societies have changed and our development agendas shifted to contextualize thinking. Libraries like museums and galleries, however, have not. For the most part, we have simply continued with the way that things have always been done, guided by trends in the developed world. When trying to understand Pacific worldviews and how this informs our memory and practice, a useful starting point is our life philosophies. These philosophies speak to the underpinning value of relationality and relationships. If the first step is bringing the Pacific worldview into our libraries, it will require a deep conversation about relationships. In Samoa and Tonga, for example, a relational life philosophy is captured in a cultural concept called the va. The va is simply defined as relational space with self, family, community, environment, the ancestors, gods, and the cosmos. This relational life philosophy is enacted by nurturing, maintaining, and reaffirming relationships, and it is guided by core values and principles. With the introduction of new technologies, we have seen a transformation of the VA, and our relationships change. The digital VA takes shape in virtual spaces, such as on social media. Engagement in these digital spaces changes not only the way we see the world and ourselves, it also changes the way we relate to each other, how we see knowledge, how we value and privilege certain types of knowledge, and how we engage with and process that knowledge. We need to recognize that our young people are being socialized into global identities. They learn about the rest of the world in the online spaces that they inhabit, spaces that those of us of an older generation do not access. In the context of a highly Western system and with little opportunity to learn about their history, language, and culture at school, we need to ask ourselves, how can we transform our systems to safeguard those values, worldviews, knowledge systems and practices that are central to our Pacific identities? And what role can libraries play? Mainstream ideologies, values, and beliefs are so deeply ingrained that it is not easy to understand the way that indigenous people view the world. Manulani Meyer explains it best when she says, we simply see, hear, 
feel, taste, and smell the world differently? How then might we bring this complex experiential learning into our libraries? We have, I'm sure, all heard of the work around decolonizing the mind, but it is one thing to talk about it and to understand it theoretically, and quite another to engage in practical decolonial unpacking. And that is where the real transformation happens. On this slide, we have two images. The first is from an exhibition at the 12th Festival of Pacific Arts and Culture held in Guahan, Guam in 2016. We are told that the Pacific Islands were settled under 4,000 years ago, but some of these shards are dated five to 7,000 years old. What does that tell us about the history of the Pacific and of our ancestors and the written history that we have been taught? The second image is a common kupesi or motif found on Tongan Natu. The Fakafo'i hair design is comprised of three dots. There are several narrative references behind the symbol, including the three main islands and three lines of kings. One reference that I find particularly interesting is that of a life philosophy pointing to conceptions of well being and alluding to balance or harmony with body, mind, and spirit. The kupesi or tapa cloth and other heritage arts, such as tattooing and sinet lashings or la lava on beams and buildings, are also seen as repositories of knowledge. Designs and symbols are textual references, capturing a database of knowledge systems that some can still read and understand as a means of visual language and communication. Just as knowledge is contextual, so is communication and text. How then might we contextualize the library as a repository of Pacific knowledge systems? How can we become more inclusive spaces that encourage reading our world both the global and the local. I would like to reflect on what it means to contextualize the Pacific Library. And to do that, let's imagine together what a library might look like if it were to decolonize its collections, create welcoming and safe spaces for Pacific communities and for members of all ages, transform the space with engaging and interactive activities that emphasize and value different ways of knowing and different kinds of knowledges, integrate technology and Pacific languages, support Pacific researchers, writers, artists, and illustrators, include Pacific oral storying and the transmission of knowledge, and encourage active reading of the world in new and innovative ways. What would that space look like? As oral cultures, Pacific people value stories. Storying as pedagogy is an inherent part of our cultural practice and knowledge transmission. Imagine a Pacific library where our elders as matua living knowledge repositories are invited to share their wisdom and stories. Consider the concept of a living human Pacific library. For this, I draw on discrete but related programs. First, the human or living library concept that originated in Denmark two decades ago, where individuals could be loaned for a fixed time to share stories that would help to overcome widely held prejudices or misconceptions about particular groups of people. And second, the UNESCO Living Human Treasures Program that was set up in 1993. It ran for 10 years until the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage came into effect. The Living Human Treasures Program identified elders and practitioners and provided an avenue 
for the transmission of their knowledge and skills to younger generations. Individuals were selected on their expertise and willingness to share their knowledge and skills. The program prioritized the value of the traditions and expressions of culture, which were considered at risk of disappearance. Imagine now if we brought these concepts together into a living Pacific library space and young people could interact in person with community elders, sharing stories and experiences. For posterity, we could create digital audiovisual resources where visitors have the option to listen to and view these living human treasures speak in their own language. We could also include the option of other language dubs, such as Pidgin, Bislama, English, or French, in line with the lingua franca, or mainstream language of communication. On this slide, we have an image of Mao Pialug, a Micronesian navigator from the Carolinian island of Satawal. Papa Mao was a teacher of traditional navigation, using what we might call navigational literacy, reading the natural elements, including the sun and stars, winds and clouds, the waves and currents, and the behavioral patterns of birds and fish. This oral knowledge system was passed on with the use of teaching aids, such as the star chart or compass that you see him here teaching his grandchildren. In other parts of the region, stick charts were used to read the waves and currents, such as the Rebelib, Medo and Matang of the Marshall Islands. And in Polynesia, navigators also used star charts. Shift now to what I call the open library. For this, I draw on the concept of mobile libraries and Professor Sujata Mitra's Hole in the Wall project. In 1999, Mitra and his team dug a hole in a wall on the border of an urban slum in New Delhi, they installed an internet connected PC. They left it there with a hidden camera filming to see what happened. What they found is that children who had not previously been online learned quite quickly how to navigate technology and internet use. And second, that children learned more and faster when they were in groups. When I think about the library and the kinds of learning that it encourages, I think of Pacific learners and the role of technology in the world today. I also think about Sujata Mitra's school in the cloud experiment. And I wonder what potential it might offer for shared learning spaces in a community library. In the Pacific, the concern with outdoor experiments such as this would be exposure to the elements and disruptive behaviors that often lead to vandalism. I remember how my own love for reading was inspired by the mobile library project in Fiji. The primary school I attended did not have a library. Each classroom had a reading corner at the back of the room with what seemed to be outdated American and British comprehension texts undoubtedly the result of numerous donor programs. There was much excitement when the mobile library visited. It was basically an old style Airstream metal caravan and we would be ushered one class at a time. There was something indescribable about the anticipation of a child walking up those metal stairs into a carpeted floor and a wall-to-wall -wall shelving containing a range of children's books. In my final year, a new school library was built. And although the books themselves gave me much joy, the excitement of the mobile library visits could not be replicated. Around seven years ago, the Fiji National Archives undertook a similar mobile exercise taking the archives into community through photographic displays. The project enabled community learning about their history and the broader National Archive database. 
there was a lot of excitement and enthusiasm around this initiative. We know that many of our rural communities and villages do not have access to a fully functional or well-resourced library or even a resource center. So what I imagine is an open library, being able to come into community for a few days of storying, meeting a local writer, and possibly combining efforts with the archives or museum to raise awareness about the importance of libraries and books. There would be an opportunity to share resources and books and to engage through technology just as Sujata Mitra's Hole in the Wall did in 1999. On this slide, we have two Pacific images. The first is of Jackie Ed Weavers in the Marshall Islands, and in the other, textile weaving in Yap. The third image is of children engaging with Sujata Mitra's Hole in the Wall. When I think about the Open Library Project, I imagine the community coming alive around the transmission of stories and weaving in our own cultural elements of storying, oratory, poetry, and traditional knowledge, while at the same time drawing attention to the importance of the written word through children's stories, as well as documentation of cultural practice and writing our own histories. The open library could focus on school clusters in various locations with school communities coming together to celebrate knowledge. It could be curated as a week long national event, bringing together local schools, teachers and librarians where there are libraries and could even include the library day dress up parade and storytelling that children love, while at the same time, including bookmaking and illustrations along with other community-based activities. Critics might ask, well, isn't that just bringing together Library Week and Culture Day celebrations? And therein lies the problem of the colonized mind. Indigenous knowledge and cultural practices are often reduced to what we call Culture Day. That is not what I am proposing. What I envision is curating a space that allows for indigenous knowledge and practice to exist alongside Western ideas about libraries and library activities. In 2019, a local artist and poet, Peter Cipelli, initiated a project called Arts at the Library in Suva. His idea was based on his own love for words and books, and the program was intended to attract children and their families into the Suva City Library. On this slide, we see a selection of images from the Arts at the Library initiative. The program covered seven art genres, including a reading program with a local book club called the Vunilangi Book Club. The Vunilangi Book Club runs a reading program in informal communities in Suva, and during the COVID lockdown, initiated an online Facebook live stream reading program for children connecting Fijians around the world. Other activities included illustration, painting, bilingual reading with the Alliance Francaise in English and French, weaving, crafts, puppetry, and recyclable art and poetry writing for children. But this was a heart project, and there were challenges around funding and managing a relationship with the Suva City Council who manage the library. As in many other initiatives, the organizers were sometimes seen as outsiders with new ideas that may not have been fully understood. Despite this, the classes were well subscribed and kids and their parents flocked to the library on Saturdays to participate in these activities. What the Arts at the Library program showed us is that while many view the library as a sterile and unwelcoming space, people will come if we organize engaging activities. 
the arts program helped shift that thinking to create a renewed excitement about being around the books, the library, and about learning. Libraries are often thought of as a research center. And while many rely on the internet and online sources, the fact remains that most Pacific books and resources are not online. The library offers a space where these could be made available via a local resource center model. Fiji has recently completed a cultural mapping exercise through the Itauke Institute of Language and Culture. And other Pacific countries have indicated their intention to do the same. On the one hand, we need to respect that some forms of indigenous knowledge are closed, sacred, and secret, and some things just can't be shared. However, there are other categories of indigenous knowledge that are open, and it is this category that the library and other repositories can draw from in appropriate, respectful ways that do not compromise the traditional knowledge holders and the intellectual property. Imagine a space where we might access writing, research, archival photographs and images that currently can only be accessed if we were to travel abroad. I'm thinking about collections held in Australia and New Zealand at the Bishop Museum Library in Hawaii, as well as European museums and their libraries. To be clear, I'm not talking about repatriation. Instead, I'm thinking about the possibility of making copies of records, digital images, and exhibitions available to Pacific libraries. As a Pacific knowledge enthusiast, I'm also an advocate for the rights of Indigenous peoples and their communities. As holders of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture, it is an atrocity that our people do not have access to our own history. I imagine a library that has both fiction and nonfiction by Pacific writers, as well as international authors, and in our own languages and a variety of formats, both print, audiovisual, digital, and virtual formats. The decolonized Pacific Library could be a space where we support our storytellers, a space where we find both scholarly and creative works, including graphic novels and other forms of the literary arts. Imagine a space where we could meet the artist, the writer, and illustrators. We could listen to them share their stories and read from their works on reading nights and in storytelling sessions. Poets could gather for spoken word and traditional chanting, and we could have the traditional book signing events alongside creative writing sessions run by these Pacific artists themselves. Nine years ago, I was a judge for the 2012 to 2013 Commonwealth Short Story Prize and traveled to Kampala, Uganda for the announcement of the winner in that cycle. In a side conversation, one of the judges said that he was very familiar with the first wave of Pacific writing in the 70s and 80s. But he wondered if there were any authors from the islands who were the big names to look out for in the coming decade. His question haunts me still, because in truth, that first wave of writing was driven by emerging writers themselves with the support of the newly established University of the South Pacific. Today, we do not have that kind of institutional support and there are no island-based publishing houses to support emerging Pacific Island writers. The names we are familiar with today are largely those living outside of the islands or with affiliations to New Zealand and other more developed nations. Sadly, our school systems do not prioritize creative writing and we do not have structured sustainable programs 
that enable local writers to sharpen or polish their craft in the literary arts. As a writer and artist myself, it is heartbreaking to hear young people speak of the passion they have for the arts and for writing. I know that there is so little support for their development and growth. There is an abundance of talent, but there is a lack of mentoring and development programs. Imagine a library that could encourage book production, editing skills, which is another area greatly lacking, and a publishing arm, which allows for small scale print runs and print on demand copies. When I think about the Pacific Library of the future, I imagine publishing opportunities in a wide range of formats, including magazines, comic books for young readers, and graphic novels, short films, and I see these in both vernacular and in mainstream languages. With the UN Decade of Indigenous Languages beginning next year, and the Decade of Ocean Science that began this year, there will be funding opportunities that we might explore for Indigenous literacy and ocean literacy. And I wish for opportunities for Pacific young people, artists and writers to be able to tell our stories. The bookshop is another important component of the library, especially as we do not have proper bookshops in the islands. Best case scenario, you might find a university bookshop, such as that at the USB campus in Suva, which has by far the best collection of Pacific books and a wide range across many disciplines, including novels. Otherwise, it is rare to find a well-stocked, wide-range bookshop. What you will find are stationary shops, which have a shelf or two dedicated to novels, largely romance and crime, as well as children's books. Or you might find a Christian gift shop with a range of Christian books. The museum gift shop may have a selection of books that are of interest to visitors. And you might stumble by chance on a variety store or boutique that has the odd local children's book or traveler's guide. There is, of course, the airport gift shop, but that requires you to be traveling somewhere in order to access their collection of books. But you might find a coffee shop which has a book exchange program. These are generally pre-loved novels targeted at an adult audience. So I imagine a Pacific library that is welcoming of Pacific communities and a bookstore where a wide range of affordable books are available and where children can see themselves and find stories of us on the bookshelves as well as in digital formats. On this slide, I have a snapshot of a handful of Pacific books from my own collection. It is in no particular order or sequence. Such books for the mature reader can only be found at the university bookstore or purchased abroad or ordered online. It is no longer enough to simply have reading rooms where we can engage with computers or devices to access digital resources. Our young people are digital natives and various sources, some of which claim to be research-based, tell us that the attention span of digital natives or millennials is very short. They say it is somewhere around eight to 12 seconds to 10 minutes of learning time. We can't say for sure which one of these is the more accurate assessment. But what we do know is that information bytes are increasingly consumed in short digital formats such as videos and memes. Understanding contemporary knowledge consumption patterns can give us insight into reading spaces and how to curate engaging and interactive libraries. The images I have selected for this slide are from various online sources and give us an example of what an engaging interactive exhibition space might look like. 
the library is competing with the small bites on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. How does engaging on these platforms rewire the brain and influence the way we now consume information and knowledge? What are the implications for books and the broader library discourse? How might we bring indigenous knowledge learning opportunities into such immersive spaces? Some of us will remember the Encarta Encyclopedia CD that you would get with a new PC in the 1990s. Imagine a virtual learning space where participants could engage with digital reality style, clicking on or viewing specific icons and accessing knowledge bases. I also imagine a Pacific style Encarta perhaps, renamed of course to something more contextual, but something that we could connect to virtually from the comfort of our own homes and classrooms and that don't require connection to the internet. The cost of technology is of course an issue, but dreams are free. And it is only by dreaming that we imagine new possibilities. For some of you who come from better resourced and technology advanced context, you may already be working towards some of these initiatives but for the Pacific Library in the islands, this is not yet a reality. Imagine the power of such virtual learning spaces in the context of climate migration. With the increase of new generations of Pacific people born and living in places and spaces disconnected from their homelands, such repositories could be a way to connect our people to their island homes and identities. Libraries need artists and creative thinkers to deconstruct and rethink spaces. Here, we have images from New Zealand artist, Lisa Rehana's In Pursuit of Venus. In 2019, I attended the Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art, and I was privileged to watch her panoramic video, a digital moving image that interprets an 1804 French scenic wallpaper that was titled, The Savages of the Pacific. As I sat in the darkened room, watching the animation of Pacific peoples in various cultural settings, dancing, preparing food, tending to the sick, and engaging in traditional tattoo practice, I couldn't help but feel sad. I was sad that young people in the region don't have such immersive experiences, and I realized how privileged I was. I thought about the opportunities for learning, connecting history and cultural practice with research, with writing, with stories, and with books and libraries. The decolonized library that I imagine will necessarily bring creative works like this one, allowing for debates and discussions around art and writing, who we are, our history, and the need to tell our stories in such technology-enabled virtual spaces. To realize this transformation, we will need strategic partnerships especially with local communities and with other knowledge-based institutions. At a time when the World Wide Web dominates the knowledge economy with knowledge that is generated in, by, and for the developed world, where else can we privilege our knowledge systems? Where else, if not for our own knowledge institutions, can we present Pacific knowledge alongside Western mainstream knowledge? This will require the decolonization of the mind that I had referred to earlier. A process which Kenyan novelist 
and post-colonial theorist Gugi Wa Thiongo says, is an active rethinking of what is worthwhile knowledge, as well as reclaiming spaces for our languages so that we can reconstruct our place in modern culture, our history and identities. For us in the islands, it means decolonizing the minds of our own people, many of whom would resist such changes as I have suggested. Some may resist this transformation, calling it sacrilege and an affront to the colonial structures that establish them. This tension is inevitable, but it is a necessary battle if we really want to decolonize and reclaim these spaces, making them relevant for our people today and in the future. Sustainable libraries need sustainable funding. This means working with community, particularly with indigenous and local community leaders. And we may find an ally in the arts community, which is also under-resourced. They bring to the conversation writers, artists, and illustrators, as well as art supporters in a mutually benefiting relationship. State funding and local investment from the private and public sector will be necessary, as well as philanthropy and support from technology providers. The Friends of the Library Initiative could be further harnessed to develop, support, and mobilize innovative fundraising. A particularly important and sensitive conversation with development partners will be critical to garner the support that we need for this Pacific-led and Pacific-driven library movement. Development agencies that currently support education could be mobilized drawing attention to the Pacific Islands Literacy and Numeracy Assessment, or PILNA. PILNA tells us that literacy rates are lower than we would like, and that boys are consistently underperforming in comparison to girls. To improve basic literacy, we need strong reading and writing programs, and libraries can play an important role to assist with this. In summary, we need to have some hard conversations around colonial legacies, and we need to confront the silence around these legacies. It means telling our stories and remembering the pain of culture loss and language loss. It means recognizing that our stories are too often reframed and told from the perspective of outsiders. This pain is necessary so that we might focus on healing, reclaiming, and the rethinking that will allow for the reconstruction and curation of Pacific-led spaces. In this rethinking, I am drawn to the HOPE methodology which was designed as part of the Decade of Education for Sustainable Development in 2009. It argues that meaningful initiatives connect with local communities. The four key principles of the HOPE methodology are around holistic approaches that are tailored to ensure ownership by the community, active participation of the community, and are ultimately designed for the empowerment of that community. For me, decolonizing the library represents an initiative of hope, healing, and restoration. On this final slide, we have an image from the Solomon Islands Vaka Taumako project, and beneath it, a carved contemporary art installation of a va'a at the Tusitala Hotel in Apia. These images represent who we are and how we are perceived, as well as the ongoing struggles that we navigate. Our identities, values, knowledge systems, and practices are too often seen as purely ornamental or decorative, when in fact, they are the source of our resilience, 
our survival and hold the key to what will enable the next generation to thrive. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you, Malo and Vinaka. Thank you so much to Francis for that fascinating insight into what a decolonized library could look like, living libraries, living human treasures, a radical redesign of how they look, how they work, how they fit, and an active rethinking of what is worthwhile knowledge. Thank you to everyone for your feedback and questions. Francis is already answering these for us because of connectivity issues. It's possible for her not to come live to answer questions, but to um, she's busy in the discussion stream and also in the live Q&A answering your questions. So we will get all of those collated and present them to you as soon as we possibly can. And can I say on a shallow level, Francis's voice is just the most beautiful thing. I would like you to record audio books, please. So um, we have all been very good this morning and I think we deserve a biscuit. So we're going to have morning tea. We're going to it a little bit late, but that's for a good reason. Uh, we're going to so grab a coffee, grab a snack. Uh, remember today's Quiz. The link is accessible in the quiz session information. It's open all day, but you can have a crack at it now if you would like to do that. Can I just let you know the winner of yesterday's quiz was Gail Cook from Dunedin. Gail Cook. Uh, clever points go to Sarah McCallum, uh, Christchurch City Council. Yes, City Council, Christchurch. Christchurch, for doing the quiz twice and therefore making her second attempt the fastest all day. Brilliant. I like your, uh, I like your hot spa, Sarah. It's fantastic. We also had entries in the quiz from Glasgow uh, and Sydney, but most of them from Aotearoa. So go do that. Go stretch. Go get some sunshine if there is somewhere you are. And we will see you back here just before the concurrent sessions begin at 10.30. That's quite soon. The first ever Lianza debate is about to happen. Ooh, and there's a comprehensive selection of paper and lightning talk presentations. So go have a break and then come back. We'll see you very soon. Kaki te anō.